today is the guest of the week show and this is your host Anu. We are talking about kidney diseases with our special guest in the studio, Dr. Arun Chandrakantan and uh, he is uh, giving us a lot of uh, useful information about how we can avoid uh, getting into trouble with our kidneys and as well as you know how important it is to take care of and drink lots of water. So, um, Dr. Arun, thank you so much for all the information and uh, let's talk about uh, how we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, get, avoid these things with the hypertension, but not only that, we talked about kidney transplant, how difficult it is to um, get the donation of kidneys and what are the issues that are involved with that one, because I know that we all are concerned about the matches and uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so with, with kidney transplantation, um, uh, transplantation is only done when people develop very advanced uh, kidney failure. So we have some measurements of kidney function that are either done based on lab work or based on what we call a 24-hour urine sample. Mm -hmm. And so people uh, either have to be very close to dialysis or on dialysis. So in that, in that population, um, those people are eligible to be worked up for transplant uh, and you know, they go through a candidacy process, which means that they, they are assessed from many angles um, by, by a medical person, by a surgeon, by a social worker, sometimes by psychology and psychiatry to make sure that they feel that they are adequate to go through with this. Also um, by, by a, what we call a selection committee, which, uh, which is a group of people that have not seen the patient to make sure all the, the data looks okay mm -hmm. on paper and, and that the pa patient is ready to go through with it. So when that uh, w when that selection process uh, is found to be adequate, the patient can actually be placed on a list uh, which is um, uh, basically a, uh, a nationwide list where, where um, they can be matched to people that uh, pass away in the community and there is an elaborate network uh, of organizations um, that, that, are, that, that is uh, sponsored by the government that actually procure organs not mm -hmm. only for kidneys but for livers, for hearts, for lungs and for other things even cornea and other things like that. Mm -hmm. So the, there are about 95,000 people in the United States waiting for a kidney transplant just to mm -hmm. give you a general idea of the numbers. Okay. There's probably about 450,000 people in the United States uh, who are on dialysis. Okay. Um, now if once they they get on the list they also have the option actually of seeking what they call a living donor mm -hmm. which is a friend uh, or a family member uh, somebody that is willing to donate a kidney to them that person actually goes through a pretty intensive process of screening to make sure that they are medically suitable as well as they are wanting to to, to do this mm -hmm. um, doing it for the right reasons mm -hmm. uh, and if um, the in that process the people have to be blood type compatible which okay. means that if they're not blood type compatible then we have another system which is called paired exchange okay. where people can actually swap living donors. So what are the deep medical terms that we actually are looking at you know when you match those uh, kidneys from person to person like you know that you, okay so I can accept the kidney from this person. So what is it that we actually look for? So pretty much the major barrier um, in terms of kidney transplant is, is what we call tissue type matching, okay. which means uh, blood group compatibility. Okay. Because the human being, the way that, uh, that Bhagwan has made the human being, right. essentially uh, it, 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 it senses for self versus non-self. Mm -hmm. So it looks for what is made by, by that own immune system versus what is coming from an outside immune system. Okay. So it knows Knows, the immune system knows when um, there is a kidney place that is not from its own immune system and immediately mm -hmm. it will react against that kidney. Mm -hmm. So the blood group has to be compatible so that the body will, uh, uh, that the body will be able to mm -hmm. accept that kidney with medications. Okay. The medications are good enough where we don't need to have very extended matching mm -hmm. where we don't need to, to, to have very close mm -hmm. matching of the immune system mm -hmm. but we, we can overcome that barrier with medications but blood group matching is important because otherwise there are other maneuvers that need to be done like taking the spleen out doing other things to the immune system right. that are much more complicated and are not done uh, kind of in the mainstay of transplant now in your medical career have you ever seen like even like uh, whatever the very small percentage of uh, happening that after you transplant if their body could reject it even after matching everything is there a possibility that 
can happen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We we have lots of problems with uh, with rejection also. Okay. So um, you know, so so that is something that we are screening for continuously. Okay. Um, and essentially, mm -hmm. we, uh, we 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 are basically seeing patients on a very regular basis mm -hmm. in order to 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 prevent them mm -hmm. uh, from having problems uh, with rejection. I think that was a wonderful information about uh, kidney health and uh, let's uh, go over a little bit about hypertension because this is an increasing issue, health issue that we are facing right now uh, with the you know upcoming uh, generation and uh, um, tell us a little bit about like what exactly is a hypertension and uh, how we can prevent it and what contributes uh, to the severity of it in this uh... so hypertension uh, is a problem where people have uh, elevated blood pressure measurements okay. and the the blood pressure reflects um, the the heart when it pumps blood against the circulation meaning that it reflects the the tonicity or the the um, pressure of the vessels that are actually receiving the blood mm -hmm. and it also reflects how the heart receives blood during the state when it's actually filling. Right. So with, most people know that there is a sta state of the heart that that actually happens when it fills, mm -hmm. and there's actually a state of the heart when it actually uh, when it actually pumps blood throughout the body, mm -hmm. and that's continuously happening. You can feel that with your own pulse. Okay. Um, and so when you have elevated blood pressure measurement, what it reflects is actually a problem where the body is 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 having a problem where your your the heart is pushing against an increased pressure. So mm -hmm. you know that. If you try to press a uh, push against an increased pressure at any time, mm -hmm. the heart works harder to do that. Right. And over time, that hurts the heart, okay. it hurts the blood vessels, and it hurts the whole circulation. And what what is the major contribution to it? Is this a stress or is this the eating habits or what could be or both or um, even more to it? There's probably there's probably multiple factors. One mm -hmm. is probably family history. If you have a family history of hypertension, that makes a big impact. Um, second, uh, eating habits and um, you know with high salt intake uh, have an impact. Mm -hmm. Third would be obesity. Um, and so uh, you know we talked about the sedentary lifestyle, but having um, increased weights mm -hmm. um, make the the tissue amount in the body higher which means the blood circulation has to be more which means the heart has to has mm -hmm. to work harder mm -hmm. and then of course diseases that affect the heart sure. um, hyper the hypertension itself can affect the heart but mm -hmm. diabetes and other diseases that affect the heart compromise the heart function and then and then make may make the heart not work as well as it should and so those contribute and of course kidney disease okay. um, uh, will also be associated with hypertension because because the kidney plays an important role in terms of regulation of blood pressure through secretion of different hormones and we did not know that so how deeply they are interconnected with it and also keeping health with both of them is very important and uh, uh, and also the talking about the hypertension um, and uh, heart transplant and also all the kidney transplant. So what are the aftermath? Like what are how, what kind of a life uh, uh, that we are expecting? Like if, for example, after the kidney transplant. So what kind of a care that a person needs or anything that needs to be extremely being cautious about? Yeah, so there's a lot of different aspects to that. So one is that um, the, the first is the actual transplant itself and the post hospital part of it. Mm -hmm. So usually um, patients are in, in the ICU for a day or two after the surgery mm -hmm. and then they transfer to, to a transplant floor after that. Mm -hmm. And they are being washed closely to make sure that they have no technical or surgical complications mm -hmm. uh, of the procedure. At the same time, a lot of new medications are introduced um, in order to suppress the immune system mm -hmm. to prevent the body from actually rejecting the kidney. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so, so this the, this is the first aspect of care, which would be the the patient actually in the hospital setting. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is is that um, the patient is discharged and then they are expected, and even before transplant, this is discussed with them, mm -hmm. but they're expected to have what we call post-transplant support, which mm -hmm. means that they are um, asked to have family members or friends that stay with them mm -hmm. in the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth area um, to, to basically assist them with their care in coming to the clinic. Um, as you know, there are you know this is a big metroplex you know the million the numbers are around seven million or so for Dallas Fort Worth mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of patients who come from outside the metroplex also for transplant right. and so they stay up in this area for about four to six weeks um, uh, you know uh, I personally work at the Baylor University Medical Center and Baylor All Saints Medical Center mm -hmm. but also see transplants from Methodist Dallas and and uh, Medical City as part of the Dallas nephrology group mm -hmm. um, so they um, 
uh, you know, so in the post-transplant setting, you can expect that the patients are going to need, you know, help with, um, you know, activities of daily living mm -hmm. uh, because of pain control issues. They also need help in taking their medications because a lot of the medications are new. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to need help with transportation. Sure. And depending on how long it uh, takes for the body to recover mm -hmm. is really how long the individual mm -hmm. patient will require. If you're a young person, you may bounce back faster. Mm -hmm. If you're an older person, it may take you, you know, okay. another six, so, so six to eight weeks might be for a, for an older patient with more medical problems yeah recovery. younger patient maybe four weeks well that's a wonderful uh, information and uh, uh, talking about like uh, one more very important i think uh, issue that we must address in this uh, uh, talk is uh, about binge drinking in teenagers that's becoming a very uh, common problem among our uh, community so uh, just tell us a little bit like how young you know they are and they're drinking it and how deeply it will affect their health as they continue doing that yeah it's it's got a big um, impact um, I think that um, youth are not well educated to the to the effects of alcohol especially acute alcohol intoxication mm -hmm. um, as my role in the kidney um, program at Baylor we also are very involved with uh, liver transplant patients and you know I see I see a fair bit of liver disease not as the primary physician but many times as somebody who takes care of the medical problems in both the pre the patients who are looking at for liver transplant and afterwards yeah. and so just looking at that population you see the devastating effects of, of alcohol use and chronic alcohol use um, mm -hmm. you know people young people who come in um, you know and I've seen this several times unfortunately but young people who come in who, who basically have been drinking and many times die actually because they are not found to be candidates for liver transplant many of them are doing drinking secretly Oh, wow. um, and the family members actually many Don't times are not even aware that it's happening, perhaps happening on weekends, like you mentioned, binge drinking right. and so on. Mm -hmm. So they have this active, productive life during the week. Um, but unfortunately, the alcohol is a problem. Um, the family members are not watching and then they present and they're very sick. And in some of those go, people actually go on to die. Um, uh, and so when you see a couple of those cases, then you become more sensitized to understanding that mm -hmm. this is a very uh, difficult problem in, in, in the community and, and requires a lot of awareness and education. Yeah, and it's growing day by day. That's, uh, that's of a very high concern. And uh, I think every parent, I mean, no matter how much they careful they are, I think it's uh, spreading like a uh, really virus, like so many uh, among teenagers. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Desi Masi Tam Radio, and uh, this is a guest of the week show. And our studio number is 817-440-4545. And uh, moving on to our uh, very interesting topic today that um, Dr. Arun is also a very, very active volunteer in one of the very popular organization called Seva International. And let's see how we are going to find out more information and a very interesting information as well. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Arun like uh, in his own words about the information about what this organization is and how he's uh, interested in involvement with this organization and what it is and what is our focus. And more than anything, uh, we will be talking a very specific topic uh, today to do with the Seva International's contribution, uh, which is towards the Bhutanese um, community. So tell us, Dr. Arun, I know you mentioned about uh, your volunteerism in Seva International. It's, uh, uh, it's very honorable that you take your time off to get involved as a doctor volunteer in this organization. So what exactly is this Seva International? So Seva International is a, is a Hindu faith-based organization, um, uh, but, and it's a non-profit charity. Mm -hmm. um, the idea behind um, uh, Seva has been that the organization serves all communities, mm -hmm. um, but it's based on Hindu principles. Um, and you know, it's based on the concept of, of the Sanskrit word Seva, which is uh, which we, we think of as service mm -hmm. and service beyond self right. and it's it, the idea behind seva actually is to promote volunteerism in the community through different community uh, initiatives 
Um, the way I would put it is, mm -hmm. in, in, in Seva, we talk about, uh, we talk about serving people. Mm -hmm. We don't talk really about helping people. Mm -hmm. The idea, the difference being that when you help somebody, you can have an expectation of return. Mm -hmm. um, when you serve people, it, much like our, um, uh, our Hindu concepts, you, you, you serve an individual because that individual is a representative of God mm -hmm. um, uh, or part of that uh, Paramatman, mm -hmm. and you don't expect anything in return. So it's basically service without expectation in return. It's, uh, I mean, I'm very sure it's a well-known international organization and uh, very popular for volunteers and providing an opportunity for every volunteer to serve uh, who are willing to give their time and contribute their uh, service hours. Um, tell us that, you know, how did you get involved in this uh, organization and what was your motivation or the inspiration to join this organization? Yeah, so, you know, I, um, I'm part of other uh, community-based organizations in town and Mm -hmm. um uh, and I'll just mention a couple of a uh, couple of those organizations that have provided me both uh, uh, my foundation and my support for mm -hmm. all the initiatives I do in Seva. So Sanatana Dharma Foundation, um, which I've uh, I, which I've been in since I came to Dallas, uh, which is headed by Kalyan Vishwanathan and also um, by Gopal Ponangi and uh, Hari Ram Subhu. Mm -hmm. um, this organization. Um, uh, provided my my foundation for a lot of the work that I currently do in the Bhutanese community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they they do Hindu based uh, awareness uh, work, mm -hmm. and I initially started my Bhutanese community um, outreach mm -hmm. uh, work when I was uh, in when I was actively uh, working uh, in SDF, and even now I, I do uh, mm -hmm. work with SDF. Okay. And the the reason that I had joined Seva was was that Seva was outreaching to um, uh, these Bhutanese refugees. Mm -hmm. as they came to the United States in, in 33 cities in the United States. So I felt that um, if I wanted to channelize my energies, it would be good to work with an organization whose intent and focus was to outreach to these refugees, that I could I could synergize uh, with them. So so I have been working, uh, I, I joined SEVA as a part of an initiative to, to, to work uh, specifically uh, in the Bhutanese community and to serve the Bhutanese community. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Masti Time Radio Guest of the Week with your host Anu and today's our special guest is Dr. Arun Chandrakantan and he's talking about involvement of uh, himself as a volunteer with the organization called Seva International. Uh, Dr. Arun, also, let's uh, find out a little bit, explore uh, about the this uh, so-called Bhutan. It's a very beautiful uh, country. It's very small. So any information that you can contribute uh, yeah. about this I, th I think the uh, listeners should understand um, the background of the the Bhutanese uh, refugee problem um, mm -hmm. so Bhutan is a country um, a as you said it's it's a beautiful country it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, a kind of a, a, a locked between different countries close to Burma in, in India and Nepal mm -hmm. and um, it's got the thousands of year history um, it's it's a country that follows the um, Tibetan Buddhism Mm -hmm. And it's based on a theocracy, which is a, a king is the ruler, mm -hmm. and the king is the ultimate authority in the country. Mm -hmm. And um, what what happened in Bhutan was that um, about 150 years ago, mm -hmm. from Nepal, uh, many um, uh, people uh, began to settle in southern Bhutan, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps attracted by agriculture and attracted by the opportunity to do, to do farming. Mm -hmm. And so there was a large uh, Nepalese community that that actually immigrated to Bhutan. Mm -hmm. As the numbers grew, they began to uh, they began to uh, want some representation in the country uh, they wanted some language representation they wanted some of their culture to be uh, taught in schools and so on the the Bhutanese uh, community the, the the Bhutanese government felt that this was a threat to the cultural integrity of the country mm -hmm. so in the uh, late 80s um, there was a genocide that was uh, um, perpetuated against um, this group of settlers mm -hmm. um, of, of Nepali origin um, the world is not uh, well aware of this but mm -hmm. if you go to the if you the Hindu American Foundation actually has documented and, and written a great history of this as well as the Himalayan Academy the Hinduism Today magazine mm -hmm. has documented this also if just search that and you will find that but anyway what happened was was that 
this community, um, about 100,000 people of Nepali descent, um, and they were not only Hindu, I will mention, um, there were Buddhists, um, so, uh, the, and there were Hindus, mm -hmm. and there is a religion called Kirat in Nepal. Mm -hmm. These people were actually forcibly exiled and became stateless, mm -hmm. and actually forced into refugee camps uh, in Nepal, which the United Nations began to administer. And what happened was that the United Nations um, tried to come to broker a solution between Nepal, India, and Bhutan to to resettle these people. Bhutan refused to take them back, mm -hmm. and essentially, um, uh, these uh, the the United States and some other European countries actually agreed to take uh, people. So, United States accepted 60,000 people wow. on refugee status, and they've been coming for about seven, eight years. And then there were some other European countries like Holland and so on that accepted uh, these people. And so um, the Bhutanese community has immigrated because of, of reasons of forced genocide. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if they had had the opportunity, they would have stayed in their own country, right. but they were forced out. Uh, it's, uh, I've also heard that, you know, this uh, very special things about uh, uh, Bhutan is uh, it's the second largest state in uh, Asia. And also the, um, it has a very interesting uh, geographical you know specialities like it has a i believe uh, it uh, the, it is in eastern himalayas and the capital how do you pronounce the capital of that thimphu thimphu i think thimphu? it's thimphu thimphu, yeah. thimphu yeah. is the and even though it is a separated uh, from nepal it's a beautiful uh, very uh, small <clears throat> country and uh, it has like a new uh, natural treasure that uh, still someone uh, you know still waiting to explore i believe there is a mountain in that one that has never been climbed i believe and uh, uh, that's one of the speciality of uh, bhutan and i think if i'm right if i can pronounce it the name of that one is uh, gangakar ponsam is the one mm -hmm. and i hope we, if anyone <laughs> from bhutan is listening to this show i hope i pronounced it right because uh, that's the highest uh, unclimbed mountain um, in the whole entire world is mm. uh, what uh, people say and also you know it is it very very interesting um, thing about is the least corrupt country is uh, what also the title goes to uh, Bhutan that's something that we definitely are uh, interested in knowing and then probably try to adopt as well uh, as much as possible mm. um, and it's a small country and still under development. And uh, with all the factors that we discussed about just now, uh, I'm sure that they contribute uh, towards uh, uh, this. So let's talk about this conflict of, uh, you know, these uh, refugees that has been exiled, like, you know, the, uh, what, what would be the situation at that time? So like, you know, because of the ethnicity and all the religion and culture, uh, I believe that they, really follow very deeply into the buddhism if i'm right so so actually actually the the community is predominantly hindu actually hindu. yeah okay. it's predominantly hindu but uh -huh. but uh, has uh, buddhist mm -hmm. and has a kirat community which is the kirat community follow om and they also have some inclination toward following saivism to some extent mm -hmm. but they are probably a reflection of cultural practices that go back to nepal probably maybe even a thousand years uh -huh. it's actually kind of separate than hinduism but mm -hmm. and so they don't really refer to themselves as hindu they have actually have their own cultural group here even in dallas mm -hmm. um i wanted to come and just one or two things um um prime minister modi ji visited bhutan as you wow. know within the last year mm -hmm. um as an attempt to for india to um you know expand uh, mm -hmm. ties to that population mm -hmm. and the other thing is uh, the bhutanese uh, refugee population ha had lived in the camps uh, many of them for about 20 years mm -hmm. before this problem this resettlement problem mm -hmm. had you know had come to some logical conclusion so there is a whole generation of people that actually had lived in in these refugee camps so this is uh, just not about only the 60,000 people who migrated to US I'm very sure that there are more than that and uh, the other uh, part of the world also accepted them. So any other countries that uh, have uh, accepted these refugees? Unfortunately, um, India and Nepal did not accept uh, mm -hmm. uh, these refugees. Perhaps India because of the, the, the way the government's stance was at the time uh, with the previous government. And then um, 
you know, Nepal also did not see them as part of their own community, perhaps because they had immigrated mm -hmm. um, uh, such a long time back, um, and also maybe because of finances, uh, that's also possible. But so they had immigrated actually to to some of the other European countries that have accepted refugees, which um, you know, uh, Amsterdam is is a place that that some of the people had gone, mm -hmm. and then Brussels. Mm -hmm. um, those communities are smaller than the communities in the U.S. I mean, mm -hmm. we we actually the the largest community of of Bhutanis in Texas is actually in Fort Worth, mm -hmm. uh, but the largest community of Bhutanese in the United States is now in Columbus, Ohio. So basically, all these refugees are Nepali speaking uh, Bhutanese. Correct. Am I right? That's and correct. these are like southerners, basically. That's, that, that's, that's correct. They're okay. all Nepali speaking. None of them, I mean, some of them speak the native language of Bhutan, which is Bhutanese, uh -huh. but, uh, but their in, in, cultural customs are all Nepali. So what were, what were their, uh, you know, the uh, when they, I'm sure that, you know, migrating from one country to another country is an easy task and definitely to put up with a lot of uh, uh, difficulties. So what was, like as far as uh, we know, America is a very diversified country and accept everyone and then creates an opportunity for all of us to live our dream life. And uh, so what was that that they f found so comforting here and how did they resettle here? Uh, and uh, and this you know gave probably Seva gave them an opportunity to also uh, become the more comfortable here as well. Yeah, so so I I will address it in many from many different facets. So mm -hmm. so one is of course um, you know, they never wanted to originally leave Bhutan and they were forced to do that. Then they lived in the refugee camps and. Um, you know, living as a refugee, if you look at some of the photos of the camps, and they're mm -hmm. available on the internet, mm -hmm. um, it was a very meager existence and, and basically being given handouts by the UN. Mm -hmm. um, and and so many of them chose this opportunity, and there was some resistance from some people because they wanted to go back to Bhutan originally. But, but basically, they took this opportunity because they wanted an opportunity for their children and themselves to have um uh you know a better life you know mm -hmm. to to be able to like you said to make some make something of themselves to to be able to um you know to to make something better mm -hmm. the problem essentially was of course they were coming to um you know a foreign culture mm -hmm. a language which is entirely different especially for the older people who have a harder time you know who many many of whom are only nepali speaking and illiterate people mm -hmm. um who are doing basically agricultural work um it it, it is it has been a very big cultural challenge. Um, the United States, the way it functions is there are about 10, 10 relief or refugee organizations mm -hmm. that are paid by the federal government um, in, in order to resettle refugees. Mm -hmm. And all of those uh, organizations are active in, you know, in Texas. Right. And so generally they go to big cities, although we've had some uh, population also go to Abilene also. Okay. Um, but, but essentially the people saw it as an opportunity for them mm -hmm. to be able to come and, and to have a, a better life you know, not to live in a camp and to, to have a roof over their heads and for something to happen with their children. So, but whenever the, you know, the family moves from one country to another country is the very basic, very important and very critical uh, issue that they face is the medical insurance because their health. So how did they deal with that? Yeah, so so the, what happens with these refugees is um, um, they are provided uh, six months of rent by the government. So they're, they're through the resettlement, refugee resettlement programs, mm -hmm. they're given six months. And in that six month period, they're expected to be kind of go uh, to, to be independent, mm -hmm. to, uh, to develop a job. And then to, at the end of that six month period mm -hmm. to to be able to pay their own rent. We'll talk about some of the people that had problems with that mm -hmm. maybe a little bit later on. Okay. But assuming um, that happens, they also, um, because they're, uh, these people are Dallas County residents or Fort Worth, uh, you know, or Tarrant County residents, um, they fall into the county hospital systems. Mm -hmm. So Parkland um, uh, becomes the default net for um, the Dallas County people and JPS actually becomes the default healthcare provider for uh, the people in Fort Worth. So that actually is, is kind of taken care of um, um, so a lot of them have are on the Parkland plans mm -hmm. and then in Fort Worth on on the JPS plans uh, mm -hmm. for health insurance the problem comes for a lot of the people and and I encourage the listeners to think about this a little bit is that 
as the people as they stay here five years mm -hmm. they become eligible for for citizenship mm -hmm. and um, you know and, and many times um, as they become citizens actually the way the health care plans work sometimes they actually can lose health insurance right. and that becomes an acute problem for especially the older people mm -hmm. they haven't paid into the Medicare system mm -hmm. um, because they've never worked um, so it becomes difficult for them to even get you know a Medicare or even to pay for Medicare so, so there are a lot of challenges that they face, and so we are trying to to help in whatever way we can. Running some, we are we partner with a lot of organizations. An organization called Health Hub, mm -hmm. which is part of TIPS, uh, Texas Indo Physician Society. They've done a couple of health fairs in Dallas and Fort Worth, um, and we encourage people to. There are of course Hanuman Temple and other temples. Uh, they do health fairs. Mm -hmm. We encourage people as much as possible to go to those um, uh, things if they have uh, problems. And also, the TIPS runs a clinic, right. um, and they've all also partnered with us and and we've actually transported people to the tips clinic um, opposite the DFW Hindu Mandir and and they they have helped some of the people also those who uh, are not aware of what tips is it's an Indo physician uh, organization that is uh, actually serving in uh, Dallas Fort Worth community and doing a wonderful job um, giving these services and bringing the awareness of all the diseases and uh, all the many many physicians are involved in this one and uh, helping all the community to bring the awareness of all the diseases so uh, <clears throat> and what about the education like I'm very sure that a lot of children were involved in this refugee uh, community as well so did the government provided any kind of a support to uh, these children right so what happens is um they they are kind of inducted into the public school system mm -hmm. so um, the the Dallas community lives um, near Park Lane which is near Presbyterian Hospital right off of 75 mm -hmm. the Fort Worth community is much more is is uh, has much more separation um, there's a big group uh, off of campus drive uh, called Ladera Palms and then there are smaller communities um, uh, Fountain Corner Brent Brentwood these are other communities so they basically go to public school mm -hmm. um, the problem becomes that um, you know the children obviously are behind in studies I mean mm -hmm. there was education in the UN camps and mm -hmm. and they were going to school but obviously the quality of the education is very minimal mm -hmm. so many of them come in quite behind um, many of them uh, the problem is that the families don't know the value of education mm -hmm. because they themselves are not educated the parents are not educated right. they don't know the value of education um, so in towards those efforts mm -hmm. um, Seva um, for many years under um, the leadership of, of different people in the Seva group um, spe specifically uh, Dr. Mukul Saran mm -hmm. he basically have run SAT classes mm -hmm. um, that have been basically trying to provide supplementation mm -hmm. um, for um, for the Bhutani students and they've done an amazing job you know mm -hmm. um, there have been about s uh, six students from the Bhutanese community who have won a Gates scholarship which mm -hmm. is you know the Microsoft Foundation scholarships mm -hmm. and those scholarships basically provide um, full college paid education for those particular students which is actually a very big achievement for for people who, who don't really have any financial backing that's uh, great news and hats off to Seva for involving such a great community service. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Musty Time Radio and our studio number is 817-440-4545 and you're listening to Guest of the Week with Dr. Arun Chandrakantan and we're talking about the organization Seva. Keep listening and we will be right back. <laughs> 